Um, hi, I'm Ana Karina Smith. Um, I'm class of 1998. I graduated in the college, um, communications and political science, and I'm so thrilled and excited to be here today with you all. It's just so nice. We can't have an in-person event just yet. We're hoping that we can in the near future. We'll keep our fingers crossed that everything goes smoothly with um, Panama and everything that's been going on with this virus. Um, but we're just so thrilled and excited to have Larry McDonald here with us. Hi, Larry, you can wave. <laughs> it is such a treat. Um, as you all know, we've been making huge strides to try and revamp our club and get things going again and seeing each other. And this is an environment where we're trying to recreate a little bit of that. So how many of you have been in Zoom calls that are one way only lately? Okay, raise your hand if you have. Okay, so this one's gonna be a little bit different. I'm not gonna ask you to sing and dance, so that's okay, you can relax a bit. <laughs> Other times I would, maybe we would do a treasure hunt. Na next time, maybe we'll do a treasure hunt for pen paraphernalia, but not today. Um, it's gonna be a participative event. And first I would like to um, introduce you to our organizers. And we've got a committee that's been meeting um, for a few months now and, and activate things here at our Penn Alumni Club. So if you can all, if you're here and you can wave, I'll call your name. And if you're not, maybe, you know, we'll just call you at the end as well. So we've got Donald Canavaggio. I don't know if he's signed in yet. Julio Germán Arias. Hi, Julio. You can quickly, you can wave so everybody sees you. He's Huntsman. I don't know everybody's graduation year, but Huntsman 14, that I know. Um, we've got Victoria Arango. And Gina Faru, Gina's here. So I don't know if she's on camera right now. If she's not, that's okay. You can see her beautiful picture. I am, I'm here. Yeah, appreciate it. Hi, everybody. We have Mr. <laughs> Mr. Danny Mizrachi, the newest member to our organizing committee. Hello, Hi, everyone. Danny. There he is, the man. We've got Mr. C.E. Maurice Belanger in the house. He is the rainmaker, okay? Because you know what? He actually reached out to this amazing guest that we have today, Larry McDonald. And, you know, Larry McDonald is relaxing in Rio Mar right now, and he's made time to be with us today when he could be doing something like, you know, <laughs> relaxing their happy hour time. So thank you so much, uh, Maury, for making this possible. And of course, Larry, for accepting the invitation. And then we've got Juan Carlos Ortega. Hi, Juan Carlos. You can wave as well. Juan Carlos is one of our youngest members, and he's been organizing um, our new YouTube series called Panamanian together with the youngest, the young, Miguel Eras, current student, not the one at Bahia. That's Miguel Eras. I don't know if that's the third. Um, I don't know if he was able. He's probably studying today, so he's not here today. Juan Carlos, you can wave as well. Juan Carlos Ortega. Um, so please, if you want to unmute yourselves, let's get everybody a big round of applause because this is a special time for us to meet. And, you know, the whole speakers don't work so great at Zoom. It doesn't sound as good as in person, but the intention is there. And that's what we want. Um, some brief housekeeping. We're going to be, as I mentioned, this is a community building event as well as a learning event. And before we go into the subject matter today, which is the US elections and how um, they might impact our region and Panama and going, you know, doing a deep dive into this topic, we're gonna take a quick moment just for a reflection. And you can grab a pen if you have one. If you have one, if you don't, how about your notes on your cell phone or just your mind? We're gonna take a moment to do a quick reflection to anchor why we are here. And wouldn't it be nice for our speaker to know why we are here? Um, so as he addresses us, he understands where we're coming from. So let's take a moment, grab your pen or pencil and just jot down, these are the questions, just why is it important or meaningful to you to be here today? You all made out time, you carved out time from your busy schedule to be here today with us. So why is it important for you to be here? And why is it important to you to learn more about what's going on in the US? All right. So Juan Carlos has put those two questions on the chat and Ellie has turned on some journaling music. 
a little bit way in the background, but that's okay. So take a moment just to reflect. And I'm gonna keep, there you go. So as you think about it, think about why it's important for you. Let's think about it at three levels. We can do, if it sounds weird, we can tweak it or turn it off. Um, so you can turn it off early if it doesn't work, that's fine. That's, that's Zoom world, that's Zoom live events. So that's perfectly okay. So why is it important to you? You can also think of it in a little you know, wider level. Why is it important for our community to be together and to be here discussing this important world event? And if you want some bonus points, why is it important for the world, for us to get involved, for us to learn about what's going on? regarding the US elections in our region. So now you can take a moment if you've already jotted down your thoughts and you can you know, just throw them on the chat if you like. We, the chat is enabled right now. Let's just make sure that the chat is enabled. Yes, it is, everyone can chat. So you can type on the chat some of these thoughts. Why is it important or meaningful for you to be here? Perhaps, why is it important for the community, for the Penn alumni community and beyond? We've got a lot of friends in the house. We've got friends and family. We've invited other members from other clubs. All right. So we've got Juan Carlos who's saying, US policy is relevant and affects all citizens of the world. We've got Mary Louise Belanger, who says, because we live in a globalized world and what happens in the US affects Latin America. If any of you want to raise your real hand or your digital hand and just chip in, you can. Thomas says, to keep up all my communities. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I'm, I must say, it really means the world to me that you're here because I remember you know, that was a long time ago back at Bocalino. We used to do happy hours. I don't remember, Maury, if that was like once a month that we used to do happy hours. And, and usually it was just like five, six, seven of us. Ramiro was always there. And I specifically remember Thomas Patton sharing about his pineapples. And I was so fascinated by it. We've got Danny Mizrachi says, COVID has shown how interconnected we are. Like it or not, the best to connect positively. Absolutely. And there's a lot that ties us together, even if we didn't go to Penn the same year. Robert Adams says, economic stability during a period of great change that will continue for longer than a few months or a year. Absolutely. So how can we reach economic stability? If any of you want to raise your hand, I, you know, right now I'm, I'm on speaker view, so I can't see you if you do, but if you go like that and you want to, okay, Juan Carlos wants to raise his hand. You go. Yeah, sure. I just want to add a thought into the conversation and just say that all Penn students, we've been in the U.S., we've studied in the U.S., and even people that have not been to Penn but have been in the U.S. abroad, we understand the relevance of U.S. policy in the lives of all the members, not only U.S. citizens, but every, anyone that goes to work or study in the U.S. And even after leaving a country like the U.S., you see the impact U.S. policy has, in the life of, has on the lives of everyone and how it affects the decisions of leaders outside uh, outside the U.S. and obviously world, worldwide. Thank you so much, uh, Juan Carlos. And you know, just very briefly, um, back in 1998, that was that was an election year, right? That was Clinton bridge to the 21st century. I was actually there, and I remember all the activity on campus and how meaningful it was. I went to one of those rallies right across the street from Hill House. Anyone else around that time? Raise your hand if you're like in the 90s. Danny was around that time. Yeah, we had Al Gore come in as well. <laughs> um, that was really interesting times. He was, he was at the Fine Arts Library, um, Al Gore. Wasn't that cool? Okay, so we've got Alexander shares. It is great to keep in touch with the Penn community. Ross Perot came in too that year. Excuse me? Ross Perot came also. Oh, he did as well. Wasn't he a character? My goodness. Yeah, you were there too. Okay, Robert's uh, fun. having a blast over there. Okay, so Alexander says, it's great to keep in touch with the Penn community as this is an important part of life and great memories for each of us. And Shlomo Diane says, it's always a great opportunity to share our thoughts with more people outside similar circles. Absolutely. 
And as the saying goes, when the US sneezes, we get pneumonia. Interesting for these times. So relevance of US policy is always important. So, um, to can, I, can I add? Can I add something as well? Absolutely, Please. Luis Fernando. So, uh, well, the, the the U.S. is the first power in the world, but you got China, who is the second power in the world. And I think we, you know, we question ourselves, you know, not not if it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen, that China uh, surpasses the U.S. as being the first power in the world. But I think that the whoever wins this election can define that, you know, how quick or slow that will happen. You know, I think Trump has been putting, you know, a lot of, uh, of pressure on China and, you know, for example, on 5G and, and on some other aspects and policies, uh, the, the Democratic candidate will, will make that, uh, will, will take a different stance on that as well. So, so I think it's going to this this election will be very critical to you know seeing what happens with China. Thank you so much, Luis Fernando, and and I, I see a lot of people nodding as you say that. So I think it just resonates with a lot of people here who are here in this call. Um, so there's a lot of other messages I'm going to read through over some of them. Pan, Gina says, Jenia Farouk, um, Panama is deeply connected to the U.S. This is the most exciting and decisive election in the times I've been around. Trump came to Penn when I was a junior. There you go, Gina. And Don, Donnie Trump was around in our times as well. Um, yeah, there's some nodding over there. Um, he was a, a, a year younger than me. Um, then Rogelio Rosemena says, we depend on the dollar. So anything the US does that affects the US internationally, it affects us by definition. Mary Louise Belanger says, well, now powers are changing. And Alejandro Vasquez says, with all central banks debasing currencies, IMF hinting for a new Bretton Woods agreement, and rise of digital currencies, surely a new monetary world waits. Hopefully we can prepare and position accordingly. So I have a quick question for everybody here. And, and this is not on the script, but Larry has three levels that he can address us. He can address mm -hmm. us at the hedge fund level. He can address us at the family- um, Family office. Mm -hmm, uh, business office level, or he can address us as a lay people level. Um, so if one is hedge fund, Two is family office and three is lay people. Can you just put on the chat one, two, or three? Because I mean, we were we took our guesses. <laughs> so Juan Carlos is ready for hedge fund. There you go. <laughs> We've got a lot of tooth coming in. Miguelera says two as well. Okay. All right, lots of twos. I think you got your answer, Larry. Level, we're, we're at two. That's Thumbs helpful. All right, everybody. So I'm going to turn it over now to um, to Julio. Julio, can you wave? I'm going to turn it over to Julio. Hey, everyone. Julio is Huntsman 14. Um, Huntsman for the people who graduated before 19. Uh, year, when did Huntsman begin? I think it was 2000. Around 1984, it, existed. Yeah. it was called Pithby. That was not a good name. <laughs> <laughs> the Huntsman program and Julio is actually on the board for the Huntsman program for the alumni group at Huntsman at a greater level and that's a joint degree program in international business with Wharton and the college so we're super excited to have you here he's also got a master's degree from Stanford and another one from Oxford um, and he's currently with McKinsey so we're just thrilled to have him as part of our organizing committee and Julio will introduce you to Larry and take this on. You guys can leave your cameras on or off. You can come in and out as you please. And then we'll, you know, throw in some more interaction um, after we're done with this part. So you go right ahead, Julio, all yours. Thank you very, very much, Ana Karina, and hi to everyone on the call. It is a genuine pleasure being here with you all and especially with Larry. So I would like to take a couple of minutes to introduce Larry and then to get the conversation started. So Lawrence McDonald is a New York Times bestselling author. He's also a CNBC contributor with over 50 appearances in 2019. And foremost, he's a political risk expert and the creator of the Bear Traps Report, which is a globally recognized research platform that is focused on political and systemic risk. So we are really glad to have Larry on board. He's a good friend also of our founding president, Maurice Bellander and he is a resident of Panama in the, in the recent past. So Larry, first off, thank you very much for being here with us. And I think there's a good way to get the conversation started. So 
So as we all know, and it was mentioned in the chat, 2020 is a year of a transcendental election, maybe the most important election in the recent history of the United States of America. But there was another year 12 years ago that also had an election that changed for many people the, the history of the United States, that was 2008. And in that year, if we go back, it was a lot of political things on the table and also economic risk on the table. So we would like you to take us back 12 years, let's go in the time machine, and for you to describe us how was the world back then? How did you see it and what was happening? Well, thank you so much, Julio and Anna and Maury. I mean, the job that you folks have done to put this together, is, it's just been fantastic to be a part of it. I'm very grateful. Um, well, I would say, uh, you know, as a former Lehman trader, I ran our distress business at Lehman. And so 12 years ago, I was at, at the bank. And, um, you know, I, I, the book, our book's now in 12 languages. And I tell my wife, as a former Lehman trader, once a month, I tell her, if we sell a million, million books, we'll break even on our Lehman stock. <laughs> But, uh, but it's, it's been incredible looking back at, at, at that Lehman period because that period of financial stress had a lot to do with the election, right? It had a lot to do with uh, President Obama, the country wanted change. And, um, you know, now as we look, as we, here we are 12 years later, uh, there's a lot, lot of similarities underneath the surface. Uh, we're seeing some, you know, rising defaults in commercial real estate, in the hotel space. I mean, really big credit risk in some spots. Some of the banks, now the banks are much better capitalized today, uh, but some of the banks have you know, pretty large exposure to commercial real estate in the cities. But on the other side, uh, the consumer today is, is, is overall is in much better shape than they were uh, you know, 12 years ago. Uh, the FICO scores hit a multi-year uh, multi, multi high in the United States this week. Um, and consumer confidence, and overall things are, are actually improving dramatically over the last uh, couple of months. So it's, it's, it's a lot less, believe it or not, stressful in some ways than 2008, uh, because 2008 was such a broad hit to the uh, global economy. Uh, and you know this has been broad as well, but uh, the fiscal and monetary response is the big difference. In 2008, the fiscal, the monetary response on the central bank side of the United States was was literally like not even 20% of what we've done so far. So it's the monetary response from the Fed and the fiscal response is also three to four standard deviations bigger. And so that's why it, it feels better today than it did 12 years ago. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And I think that it's a great answer to put everything into perspective. Now, we at Study Finance, we do know that past performance is not a perfect indicator of future performance, and we're in a different year, right? And now we know that we're, engaged, we're going to this election in a couple of weeks that might change the scenario both for the U.S. and around the world. So how do you think, Larry, that we could best prepare for the results of this election, both if we were in the U.S. and in Latin America? Okay, well, there's no I in team, and thank you, Julio, for that question. There's no I in team. So what we do at the Bear Trap Support, we have a live Bloomberg chat with 650 institutional investors. That's live all day long. Our team runs it. And so the Bear Trap Support, what we do is we recap that chat for our retail advisors, family offices, high net worth families. So when I answer questions like that, it's um, it, I just want you to understand what we're doing is we're gathering data from the clients. So out of the 650 institutions that are in the chat, we have probably 50 or 60 contributors and um, they're all over the world. And so we have, these are people at the CIO, you know, chief investment officer level that are in the chat at hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds. And um, so in talking to the clients and our partner in Washington for the last 12 years has been ACG analytics. So I've done a number of calls this week and last week with ACG analytics and the hedge funds. So what we try to do is bring the most compelling uh, up to the minute data uh, to you. And, and what I, I think most of all is that um, the Fed is begging on their hands and knees for Washington 
to fiscal up. And we, Washington's already fiscal up. But if you remember 2008, Washington fiscal up. It wasn't that big. And then we went into this really nasty period of austerity. And um, because of the sequester in 2011, the fiscal response was really cut short. And a lot of weight was put on central banks. And so today, uh, for, for, you, for, people, for people to prepare, I think the big thing that I'm seeing is a fiscal and monetary response that, that leads to a much weaker dollar because the Fed is, is really begging politicians uh, to spend you know, much more capital than, than we did in, in the previous decades. So if you think of like the last 10 years, we have Brexits, we had trade wars, uh, we had austerity tea parties in the United States. So it was an incredible period for bond investors because you just had one deflationary power packed impulse after the next. Uh, whereas today, uh, it's, it's almost a, we're shifting to the complete opposite. It, it's really a much more reflation, deflation, I'm sorry, reflation, inflation environment. And so for, for Panamanian investors, to me, it sets up really well for Panama because we're, in the last 10 years, what performed really well was financial assets. And so bonds, and whether it be treasury bonds, corporate bonds, perform brilliantly. And, uh, and also big tech stocks. So fang, you know, fang stocks. So this is a de- if you look back, it, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a decade of deflation bets. And that, those bets did really well because of that constant environment, COVID, trade wars, Brexits. But now as we come into a new period of uh, reflation in central bank and uh, fiscal and monetary cohesion, um, you know, the dollar is just going to be under tremendous stress because they really want, uh, I think they, they understand now, the dollar has been in 2016 over and over again, um, last year, the, the global wrecking ball. So when you get a much stronger dollar, uh, because of all the people that trade in U.S. currencies uh, globally, it just has a massive deflationary impact. And so the, I think the Fed, the PBOC, the, the ECB, they've all figured this out, that the only way out of this COVID nightmare is a much weaker dollar. So that's good for Panama because uh, Panamanian investors, I think, I think you're going to see a real bid to Panamanian real estate in the next two years because, uh, you know, this Panamanian real estate is priced in dollars and inv- investors globally are going to be able to buy assets here. So to prepare, I just prepare for a much weaker dollar and prepare for much higher uh, bond yields. Nice. Thank you for the insight, Larry. And thinking a little bit more regionally, beyond the impact that it would have on Panama, how do you think investors that are in countries that are not dollarized in Latin America could also waive this, this moment? Well, Chile's in a great spot, Peru. These economies have you know, 40% of their economies are, are commodity-centric, right? So copper... Chile is the largest copper producer in the world. Chilean equities are really cheap here relative to copper. Is You're, you're going to need to be in hard assets. This next administration, that, that, whether it be Trump or Biden, you're going to see the biggest infrastructure plan we've ever seen in the United States. Not ever, probably ever. Because last time, you remember, um, Trump wanted to do infrastructure. And we were taking, what we do is we take the clients from the New York clients, the hedge funds, we take them around the hill. We meet with senators. I probably met with at least 50 senators in the last four years. And we do meetings with uh, Treasury. We do meetings with um, White House staff. And all the meetings last year early on, especially like in the fourth quarter of 2016, like in the the lame duck session, I guess he called for. um, So right before, after Trump won, we were doing these trips. And um, Wall Street banks were pitching like a massive, a massive infrastructure uh, deal. And it never happened because you had Paul Ryan and uh, Mitch McConnell, they put the healthcare deal in, in front. So what happens with, with any presidency, you really only have a couple of the bullets and um, they, they pushed infrastructure out and never saw the light of day. So what was amazing about that and the lesson for everybody on the call right now is you had all these reflation bets that priced in a big a big infrastructure plan and which never came to be. So by the summer of 2017, 
this whole reflation bets of copper, all the commodities were exploding higher. The yield curve, so if you think of the two-year treasury versus uh, the 30-year was steepening. So we had a, uh, the banks were, were doing really well. So if you think about that environment, uh, it was it was really, it showed you what can happen with a big infrastructure plant. So if that happens again, and this time it'll be real, you're going to get uh, a trillion dollar infrastructure plan. And it's, 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 it's the only way to replace, in the United States, we have, you know, we have 18 million people that are unemployed, but there's a good 3 million of that are, are, are potentially permanently unemployed, or at least the next two, two to three, four years. So they're going to have to replace uh, those those permanent, you're going to have to bring those people back with some type of new deal. And it's going to be infrastructure driven. And if it's infrastructure driven with a big fiscal and monetary response at the same time, and the Fed's given, you know, lots of warm accommodation, it's going to be very good for uh, commodity producing countries like Chile and Peru. Perfect. Thank you, Larry. So moving a little bit from the facts and more to the feeling. So we want to give the vibe to this event that it's like a, having a dinner conversation, right? And we do know that you were in Lehman Brothers in the moment where the things were happening. So I wanted to get back into the feelings of how were you feeling when that was happening and what stories or narratives you would like to share with the people in the audience that would help us understand what does it feel being there? Well, when I, when I wrote the book, um, I was at Lehman in, in, the, in 2008 and uh, I was very close with some of the top executives that were, it was really, it was really two tribes within the firm. At Lehman, um, there were some really good people, and uh, the, the bank was never rotten at the core. That's where all the beauty was. She was really rotten at the head. And um, so I started to talk to a number of my friends around the trading desk in 2008 in the summer and spring. and. You know, it was like peeling back the onion as you had these conversations. It, was, it became more and more terrifying because we started to realize that we had 30 to 40, almost 40 percent of our net tangible equity for the bank was in three commercial real estate investments. So you picture I was I, I ran our, you know, I was on the bond trading desk. I ran our distress business and you had all these really smart people on the, on the trading floor, uh, but they, they were fixed income people. And then you realize that, you know, the guys upstairs for every dollar we were making, they were losing, you know, potentially 10 upstairs because they, they took our capital and they put it all into three commercial real estate investments. So I, uh, I was on the summer, the summer of Patrick Robinson, who wrote Lone Survivor with the Navy SEALs. The way I pulled this book off, because I was a trader, I mean, a lot of people, the, the big question I get, I've done 140 speeches in 16 countries over the last, since, two, since 2008. The big question is, how did you put this book together being a bond trader? And the way I did it was, I, I you know, we, we had some in, insight in term, terms of how bad it was in the summer of 2008. I went up to Cape Cod and Patrick Robinson had just written Lone Survivor. It was a number one New York Times bestseller. It became a movie with Mark Wahlberg. And I was friendly with his son, his daughter, and it was 4th of July, 2008. And we were sitting there at the dinner table and I started to tell Patrick about, uh, you know, this book a potential, you know, this Lehman book that, that I thought my idea. And these two ladies in the corner of the table started laughing. And I said, what's so funny? And uh, they said, oh, another, another ass, another jerk is p pitching Patrick another book deal. Because every night on Saturday night, every week, somebody, he was so hot. He was the number one New York Times bestseller, famous ghostwriter. Um, with with the, the Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell. So he got a lot of pitches. And I looked at everybody at the table and I said, oh, that's very funny. I said, if this bank goes down, it'll be bigger than Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, and General Motors combined. And there was this long pause. And uh, Patrick was leaning back in his chair and he said, Lawrence, I'm working on Shimon Perez's memoirs. He says, I won't be done until until 2010. And I said, oh, and he said, but if she goes down by the stroke of midnight, if that bank goes down by the stroke of midnight, December 31st, uh, 2008, you'll have a deal. And lo and behold, September 15th, the bank went down and uh, it was, I'll never forget 
you know, I, I called him the next day and he said, you got to get over here. And I, you know, he was in London, about an hour outside of London. And um, I, I was terrified. I mean, I wanted to do this book deal, but I was like, oh my God, my life is going to change forever. The next morning I found myself on the tarmac at Newark airport. And as the plane, you know, we're going down the runway at 50 miles an hour, 60, 70, 80, you know, and that next wheels up. And as the plane banked toward the Northeast, I looked out the window and there were some raindrops that had rained that morning. And I looked down, I could see Times Square and the green and white of Lehman was staring, me, staring at me through the, through the raindrops. And I said to myself, it's time to go pick a fight. And I really wanted to bring that unvarnished tale of what happened in that bank uh, to the rest of the world. Thank you very much, Larry. And also people in the audience, if you want to write a book about the current COVID crisis, you know, you know how it works, right? <laughs> so I know we have some questions from the audience. I first want to give you the mic, Larry, to see if there's anything else that you would like to share that you think will be informative to our audience. And then back to Ana Karina to get us started in the next dynamic. Well, just it's just um, the best part of, of doing the book was just meeting people like yourselves and going from a trading desk where you're really talking to 10 people, uh, you know, and, and running capital. Now, uh, you know, working with people around the world, it's been it's been really rewarding. Um, I think um, some there's some great quotes that 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 we we use um, that, that that I'll share with you through the through the day. But over the years, we've had some really great quotes about. Uh, things that we've learned over the last 10 years. I'll share them with you. Thank you very, very much, Larry. And I think it, I really appreciate your candor and both the stories and the fact that you shared with us throughout the night. And I'd like to pass the mic to Ana Karina, who has a uh, next slide for us. All right. Hi. So everybody, you can unmute yourselves and give a big round of applause to Julio and Larry for guiding this wonderful conversation. It's so fantastic to hear all these inside stories. So thank you so much. You can do your reaction as well. There's a button for it in case you, oh, we've got some people, <laughs> we've got Marie. There you go. You can do these little emojis too if you wanna show your appreciation. Um, so everybody, um, I see that a lot of people are off camera and that's okay. Um, we can switch things around a bit. Originally, I was thinking of perhaps having us um, give Larry a little bit of a break um, so that we can go to small groups and do a very short discussion. But I'm thinking that everybody was so excited to ask questions and, and so willing to just um, participate right here with the larger group that I'm thinking that we can just go right ahead and, and start digging in, digging deep. How do you all feel about that? You're already, you can give me a thumbs up if you're all ready to ask some questions right here. All right, because um, there's a lot more to talk about, isn't there, Larry, huh? Oh yes, um, we've got. Uh, well, we, I've got some insights on the election. Whenever you want to go, but whatever, yeah. whatever people, whatever people want to talk about. All right, so guys, you already heard it. You can dig in about the election or anything else. So everything goes. You can dig in about Larry's personal. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna ask where, you know, where I, ju I, I, I just got my cedula, by the way. I'm really just last week, so I'm really happy. I'm just got my cedula. Good for you. That's so exciting. Wow, that's awesome. Oh, by the way, talking about celebrations, um, I forgot to mention that at the beginning. We've got we're celebrating today. Joe Fidanke is one of our dear, dear, dear members. Fifty fifth year anniversary, wedding anniversary. Isn't that something? He's not here today because I hope I hope he's had a good date. And Ana Isabel Jimenez, who's also been a member of our board, she's also celebrating her twentieth year. Uh, wedding anniversary. Are there any other celebrations around here? You can put it on the chat or just wave or is it anybody's birthday, you know, we can, <laughs> Gina my Martha, we can ask her to sing happy birthday. <laughs> you know, wrangling my neck. Any birthdays in the house or any other big celebrations? Oh, Gina's laughing. She'll sing happy birthday. <laughs> She'll play the piano too. Um, all right, so I see some questions on the chat. So this is what we're gonna do. I'm not gonna send you out to breakout rooms, which was my original intent. So no, you know, um, I love breakout rooms because they do give us a chance to connect um, at a smaller, more intimate level, and especially introverts tend to do really well 
there if they're, you know, a little bit um, hesitant about speaking up in the wider group. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to take our pens again. You can show me your pens if you've got your camera on. And if you don't, you can do it. Ah, Larry's ready with his pen. You know, I think better when I write. Raise your hand if you think better when you write. And when I write by hand, when I really want to like think, 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 I need a real notebook. Same. Oh, I've got um, other people who, who resonate with me on that one. So this is what we're going to reflect about. Ooh, we're going to reflect about two things, one or two things that I appreciate about what I just heard, what we just learned. You know, we know it was a, a deep discussion in, in this whole, you know, experience that, that Larry had with Lehman and all this. So one or two things that you appreciate, or it could be just Larry's style or the way that Julio asked some questions. One thing that you appreciate or two, or maybe on a home moment. And then one or two things that you're curious about. All right. So if there's a specific question or anything that you'd like to know more about, and we haven't gone in deep about the U.S. election, so maybe some of this will be about the U.S. election and what may or may not happen and how it may impact our region. So I hope you're writing down. If you're not writing, my mom writes in her head. Did she come, by the way? Is my mom here? Does anybody see my mom? Roxana, she was going to come. I don't see Roxana here. <laughs> All right. And while you're thinking, Larry, I'm going to ask some of the questions and comments that were here in the chat. So Alexander wrote, here in Panama being a US dollar economy, did I read that? Yeah. We are influenced by the health of US dollar. This health could be under threat Gracias. as Fed is printing a lot of money. Yeah, hold on. I hear a beautiful male voice. You can you can ask it straight out. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. So so if the dollar weakens very fast, it'll be very you know, disruptive. Um, if it weakens slowly, it will make Panamanian exports you know a lot more ch cheap in the rest of the world. Um, so net net, uh, it it depends on how <laughs> you know how if they can contain the breadth of the slowdown. Um, the, the weird thing is right now in the United States, I mean, there, there's this big debate between Republicans and Democrats around this fiscal response. And a lot of the cities like New York right now has about $60 billion budget hole. So there's this debate, whereas the Democrats uh, want this new fiscal plan that's supposed to be more for you know, getting people back to work, but they want to really bail out the states right now while they can. And so that, if they do that too aggressively in the Fed, because give me a good example. Um, the Fed's doing 120 billion a month of quantitative easing. So that means that they're buying 120 billion a month of mortgages and treasuries, 120 billion a month. But if you do the math on what the, what the deficit is, it's, it's we're over, we're close to next six months, we have to sell almost 200 billion a month more bonds than the Fed is buying. So that means in the rest of the world, uh, we need a lot of buyers of those bonds. And at the same time, the ECB is now opening up new channels. So if they're, they have to be careful because if the dollar gets out of, uh, you know, goes you know, too fast on the weak side, it would be pretty disruptive. It may be disruptive to Latin America. But at the end of the day, I would think a, a cheaper dollar um, over a gradual course of, say, two, two years would be great for the Panamanian economy. Maybe, maybe somebody can correct me on that, but I, 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 see what, I think a lot of assets would come into Panama, at least for investments. Thank you so much, Larry. And is there, I mean, does anybody want to comment on that? I mean, while we're at it, this is a conversation. It's not, there's a lot of wisdom in this group, you know. Um, we have one expert here, um, Larry, but we've got a lot of other experts in the room. So if you have any different opinion to share about what would happen with a cheaper dollar, um, we've already heard some of Larry's thoughts about real estate and exports from Panama. Um, you can raise your hand or, you know, your physical hand or your digital hand. I can't see all the physical hands though, because I've got, let me see. Yeah, I can't see. Well, it's just 
on one screen. So we've got some other questions here. Um, Shalo, uh, Shlomo Dayan says, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Perfect. Thank you, good, okay. Um, I see a lot of mention of Chile. They have been enveloped in a lot of leftist protests that may have yeah. Serious effect on their economy. What is your take on these? And Shlomo, if you'd like to expand on your question or anything else that you'd like to add to that. Well, yeah, but basically, basically the, the, the whole mention of Chile made me think, you know, uh, for a long time. I mean, it started because of uh, a raise in social security, but then it ended up, you know, with protesters, protesters burning the, the, the uh, underground stations and churches and all of that. And there's a whole thing of Chile's awakening and everything. And well, you can trace some parallels to what's going on here. I, uh, I don't know how deep in the rabbit hole we want to go into U.S. politics, but uh, you can you can certainly see some parallels. Except uh, in Latin America, it's a bit more it's a bit more severe because you have leftist, very leftist governments that sponsor these things, and we um, this is something that that happens a lot, and it's. It's going to affect countries like Chile very deeply because if the government changes hands and a non-business friendly government comes in, then what happens with the whole prediction that's that's been going on here about Chile doing better because of all the uh, commodities uh, markets and everything? Yeah, um, that, 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 yeah, that is the absolute key. So what what we do with our team in Washington is we we're constantly looking at countries around the world that have a market-friendly government that may shift to a market-unfriendly government or vice versa. And it's amazing what you, the, the returns that you can achieve if you buy an emerging market country that's in a market-unfriendly government uh, that, that becomes friendly. Uh, you can get some spectacular returns. But what's crazy about that is the market will price a lot of that in even before the election. So in other words, it'll anticipate the result. And so you're absolutely right. Um, I would say that energy prices a year ago, if you remember, it was around Thanksgiving that Chile had those nasty protests. And it had a lot to do with the fact that oil, when, the, when oil costs rise dramatically, it, it, it's almost like it's a massive tax because these emerging market countries are or they have to pay for the oil in dollars. So when the oil's ripping higher, uh, it was it was basically a massive tax on the transportation system of, of Chile. And they were trying to pass that on to their, their the public. And the public said, no, wait, no, and, it, it, and you're right. And it's and I think it maybe it's helped uh, the left. And so that's something that we're gonna be spending a lot of time on. And that could blow up the trade because you're absolutely right. All the benefits of say, uh, a, a, a all the benefits of, uh, benefits of a, a commodity, you know, improved improvement environment that would help a country like Chile could, could get destroyed. But I do think with lower oil prices right now, um, it, it's going to take some of that stress off. Uh, and, and we saw this with we saw this with Brazil. Remember, like you had Ciro Gomes that was rising in the polls before the 2018 election because same thing. We had a spike in energy prices. And uh, the truck, you know, Brazil doesn't really have a, a train, like a, a, a train, a, a, a train system the way the United States has train tracks uh, or transit system through trains. So it's all trucking. So if you have a, a rise in energy costs, it's a massive increase uh, for the, the, the trucking costs, and that, that gets passed on to the consumer, and it's going to be very, very disruptive. And if that was, uh, you know, if you remember, it's when zero to your, to your point. Brilliant point. As Ciro Gomez in June of 2018 rose in the polls, Brazilian stocks were off like 20, 30 percent a month. It was incredible. And so I, I look forward to trading the, this this Chilean election. I think it's two, November 2021. So we have a year, a year, over a year away from the big election. So uh, I think any any to the bottom line it, it finally answer the, the the point. To me, if there is socialist stress that comes into Chile, it'll probably be about, be about six months before the election. So June of 2021, if the socialists, before that, the market won't really react. But about six months out, the market will start to price in socialist risk. Thank you so much. Shlomo, oh. 
You're nodding over there. Okay, <laughs> that resonates. Awesome. So we've got another question um, is from Miguel Era says, um, is Fed intervention creating asset bubbles and have they destroyed price discovery? Oh my God, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's right on my alley. I mean, it's, they have destroyed, there is no, uh, I grew up in the 80s and 90s and you know, this capitalism doesn't exist, exist. The United States is now a crony capitalist market. Um, the Fed is buying MTA bonds, which is a, corrupt um, tran transit system in New York that is essentially bankrupt and the Fed's buying those bonds at very high dollar prices. Uh, the Fed is distorting all kinds of asset prices. And But what's weird is in some places, and this is, this is where we get into these haves and have nots, the Fed's buying Apple bonds and Berkshire bonds, but they're not, you know, they're not buying bonds in the energy space they're buying bond, airline bonds but they're not buying hotels i mean this is just an absolute nightmare mess and uh it's it's in terms of what the, the fed is distorting you know 60 70 years of american capitalism and, and i guess you know the the excuse is if they don't do that we would be in depression so that's that's the debate but yeah it, it's capitalism is not really it doesn't really exist anymore it's um it's kind of, um, we're, kind of we're, we're, we're becoming a little bit more like China every day. So I don't know, Miguel, you're, you're welcome to unmute if you want to follow mm -hmm. up on this conversation or if you want to add anything on the chat, you're welcome to do that. It's certainly a fascinating statement. Uh, yeah, conversation. Th thank you for the answer. The, the real question, obviously, the, the end question is, is there going to be an end to it? I uh, read recently that some Fed governors were thinking you know, more regulation, less uh, stimulus is the way to go. So the the fix is not necessarily better, but they seem to be aware of the fact that it's, it cannot be in a never ending checkbook, right? But I don't know, I mean, it's- Well, let, your... let's, 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 let's look back at like, so these, the Fed promised us in 2000, you know, 17, 18, that they were gonna, take the balance sheet down by two and a half trillion because they, they built the balance sheet up in 2000 after, after Lehman. And so they, over after, you know, the Obama administration, the Fed, uh, you had the Bernanke to, to yell and hand off and they built up the balance sheet. And then in 2016, they said that they were going to start to unwind that balance sheet. They basically gave you a forecast. And when they did that, and they, and they said they were gonna to start to hike rates. When they did that, the dollar ripped. I mean, it, it literally caused massive disruption for all of Latin America. It was, and it was just literally a couple of sentences that they said in, in, in 2013, you know, thir 2013 to 16, the dollar, 2014 to 16, the dollar strengthened, you know, literally from 82 on the DXY to like 105. It just, it was, a, it was very disruptive to the global economy. So the problem is, Every single time they try to get out of this rabbit hole, uh, the dollar strengthens and it blows up the global economy. And then they have to come back and ease policy. And in 2018, they promised us, um, to, to 2017, they promised like 16 rate hikes and they, they, got, they got some off. I think they got seven or eight rate hikes off. But the problem is they were doing 50 billion a month in the summer of 18, 2018, a balance sheet reduction a month. So they're trying to get out of the rabbit hole. And we had such an acceleration of financial conditions, tightness, that it literally almost caused a very fast recession. I mean, it was, it was horrific. By Christmas of 2018, that was one of the most amazing markets because Powell got up there and he told us, promised us that he was going to continue the balance sheet 50 billion a month reduction. He promised us in December that, that, that the balance sheet was on track and we're going to continue hiking rates. And literally there was so much stress that three, four weeks later, uh, he just did a complete 180. Just the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to a US central banker. Just a complete egg on the face. I'm sorry I was wrong, reversal. And that reversal uh, was, was able to put out the fire, thank God. But so, so the, the question is, I, I don't. Every time they try to get out of it, they, they 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 cause such stress and financial conditions that has a huge impact on Latin America. So I would say next thing, next time you see them try to 
forecast getting out of this and reducing the balance sheet, that's going to be a, a big negative for, um, you know, for, for, for emerging markets, big time. But that's right now, that's many, many years. That's, they promised us it's at least two years away, but, but we'll see. All right. Um, so Rogelio Arosemena put on the chat, I don't know if you saw it, that it's Juan Carlos Ortega's birthday today. How about that? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're not gonna sing happy birthday. We're all gonna just give you a lot of love. We're gonna say, I don't, I don't wanna embarrass you, <laughs> but it's so awesome that you're here today. On your birthday, you could be doing so many other things. <laughs> And you see a lot of clapping hands over there. And everybody, for those who, who walked in a little bit later, Juan Carlos is the guy responsible together with Miguel Eras, not the, the guy who just asked a question, but the, the younger Miguel Eras who's currently at Penn. And they've put together this amazing YouTube series called Panamanian, isn't that a clever name? And it's got stories of people who are currently at Penn and grads and um, you know, Gina's been in it, Miguel Eras um, was in it recently, and we had Dorita as well. Um, we've got, um, you know, a wonderful series, so big round of applause to Juan Carlos. Thank you for everything that you're doing for our club, and please, you know, just after this, just really, you know, celebrate with your family. <laughs> no, no, thank you, but my birthday is not today. It was last week, but still. <laughs> oh, that was a sneak. <laughs> All right, so we've got Alexander, um, as someone who is in the asset management business, um, I'm interested in your view with print, uh, Fed printing, a lot of extra money with huge stimulus packages, et cetera, do you foresee the US dollar will weaken, but gold will rise as the inflation will rise? Yeah, that's, um, that's it. Essentially, they're gonna monetize the debt. So if right now we're doing a $3 trillion deficit, Next year will probably be four. So it's annual deficits. So that's seven trillion of deficit spending in two years. And so that means that you know the the tax revenues in the United States just can't support that. The Fed's gonna have to buy and the bond sales can't support that globally because you have, you know, China's now selling more bonds, um, Europe's now selling more paper. So all these other countries are trying to get out of the COVID mess too. So there's just not enough. So the only way to get out of it is called modern monetary theory, but it's an experiment. And it's a theory that like, okay, the Fed can just buy all the bonds. But the problem with that is um, as in the, Fed, the Fed is suppressed. Let me give you an example. So the 10 year treasury is around you know, 70 basis points or so. And, uh, but inflation expectations, and we'll, we'll send, I have some slides, but we can send those around later. We don't have to watch them now, but whatever you want to do, you guys running the show, but definitely send them around because inflation expectations on the 10 year are at the highest level now I mean, since, since the crisis started. So as inflation expectations rise and if the Fed's suppressing uh, the 10 year yield, normally what would happen is the 10 year yield would rise with the inflation expectations. Now we're having the inflation expectations rising but because the Fed's buying all the treasuries, 120 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities and treasury, they're suppressing the 10-year. So your real rates, your, your real rates are negative close to 1%. And what that does is then bondholders right now on the planet Earth, this is incredible, right? On the planet Earth, this 110 trillion of bonds, 110 trillion below one and three quarters percent in yield. So these investors globally, 110 trillion below one and three quarters. If these investors um, are sitting on bond yields that are extremely low with inflation expectations rising, what they're going to do is they're going to buy, which they've been doing and they will continue to do, they'll buy silver, gold, copper, they'll buy commodities, they'll buy something that can offset that risk. So your what's called risk parity in the United States in investing is just the, the 60 40 stock bond portfolio is over. It's going to be stocks, bonds, and some type of commodity basket mix. And so the last 20 years, everybody's been very comfortable. The 60 40 portfolio has been incredible. During when Lehman collapsed, everybody forgets the, the stock market was down 45%, but uh, bonds, were, bonds were up uh, like 20%. So your bonds, your treasuries offset your market losses by 
a lot, like by half. So stocks in England went down, stocks went down 40, 45%. Bonds went up close to 20. If you had a, you know, a lot of bonds in your portfolio, you, you didn't get, you got hurt, but you didn't get hurt as bad as you could have. Now today, bond yields are so low uh, that, that the only way to protect that, in, it's the only way to have like true risk parity is stocks, bonds, and commodities. So and, Larry, uh, yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I put the little screen, you know, the screen share here. The format may be a little bit messed up because I, I pass it on to Google Slides. But if you quickly want to browse through them and, you know, um, through the slide deck, can you see them over there on your computer? Yeah, I'll, I'll be really quick. So this is this is the um, this is obviously the Electoral College and it, ACG Analytics, our partner in Washington. There's some talk of like what would happen if it was a tie <laughs> because we. There's actually the highest percentage chance of a, a tie, in our view, than than ever. I mean, there's this the Wall Street's talking about this blue wave, but Trump is is visiting. You know, Trump's in the last week. He's already been in front of 130,000 people in like six swing states, and um, Mr. Biden is has been at home. He's literally not campaigning. He's staying home all week uh, for either health reasons or it's a, it's, a, it's a potential scandal. For some reason, he's not campaigning. So these swing states are getting very, very tight. And um, this is just a, if there is a scenario, if it were to tie, uh, then you go into a, a whole bunch of crazy uh, <laughs> conditions around where Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, could potentially become president. Or uh, there's, there's another scenario where uh, Kamala Harris could become president. Um, so it's, 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 it's really, I don't think it's going to happen, but you know, that's the layout right there. The bottom line is uh, the Republicans have to win Florida and they have to win Pennsylvania and they have to win um, um, North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, that if they don't, if they don't, the rest of the country stacked against them. So if they don't really, they really have to break that blue wall there that, that, that they broke in 2016. But next slide. All right, I'm getting some feedback from the group that yeah. that it, it it looks small on the on the screen. Can you all just on yeah? What you can what you can do, Ana Karina, is if you click on Presentar. Yeah. There you go. People should. There you go. Is that That's better? Perfect. Okay. I just thought that it would get out of the screen setting, so it's good that it's working. Okay, you can continue. Okay, so the Senate. This is important because. The Senate, the Republicans have picked up, uh, since in 2014, they picked up nine Senate seats. 2018, even with Trump, you know, the loud mouth, you know, just the jerk, whatever you want to call him, uh, you know, they, they still picked up two Senate seats. Nobody talks about this. Why did the Republicans pick up nine Senate seats in 2014, two more in 2018? So now they control the Senate 53 to 47. The reason why this is important is a blue wave really means that the Democrats take the House, which they already have. Um, they would have the White House, but you have to have the Senate by at least five. And right now <clears throat> it's 53, 47. So you need a big, big move to get, you need to take a lot of seats, but, but out of that, 53 seats, Tuberville in Alabama is a lock for the Republicans. So the Republicans really are at 54. And um, John James, an African-American in Michigan, is uh, we all of our internal polling, he's, he's, he's going to crush it. He's, he's a rock star for the Republicans. So the Republicans really are at 55. So net-net, you know, it, it probably ends up, and we, we say this with high confidence, probably ends up with a 50-50 Senate. So the Republicans will probably lose five, but they, they've already, they, they'll pick up two, you know, they, they'll pick up two, lose, I guess, lose seven more, and then you'll end up with a net loss of five. What the, the reason why that's important is um, if, 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 the, if the Senate comes in pretty tight, it will impact um, this Green New Deal, and it will be, I think, a huge positive for energy. Energy, energy stocks are down 60, 70 percent. Uh, it's been uh, they've been a really just depressed from COVID, from ESG, which is environmental 
uh, standards that are coming into U.S. Uh, capital markets and um, the Green New Deal. And so this Green New Deal is it's a lot like infrastructure was in 2016. It's massively priced in. So if you care about energy, you want to watch the Senate because if the Senate's tight, there's no way the Democrats are going to be able to jam through this Green New Deal and uh, the 50-50 Senate will protect energy companies. So that's probably the most important part of this slide. And uh, yeah, this is just, you know, the different races the, where they are right now in terms of this is the disadvantage for the Republicans. If you notice in the red, the Republicans, and this is why there's a chance that Republicans are going to lose some seats. If look at the red, the Republicans, all those seats have senators that are Republican that are up and running, whereas the blue are the Democrats. And so um, there's a lot more Republicans running than Democrats this year. In 2018, one of the reasons why the Republicans picked up two seats is it, it was the opposite. It was uh, you had a lot more Democrats running than Republicans. So, so next slide. And this is the so this is the mind blower, right? So you've you've had four years of Trump, the most, one of the most you know controversial, you know hated by the Democrats. And what blows blows us away is if you look at um, the ballots requested in some of these states like Pennsylvania, uh, you're seeing a lot more Republicans come in uh, to to read, to to request ballots uh, to register to vote, and so. This is the big mind blower because you're 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 you should have a big surge of registrations from from Democrats in swing states, and if you look at the data here closely, um, you're you're seeing a, a, a big change in ballots requested, and a lot of that. And we'll get to the next slide. A lot of that's Republicans. If you go to the next slide, okay. So so this is your red versus blue. So. You, in these in, the, in these red states, you're seeing more uh, people request ballots on the Republican side than the Democrat side. And these are these are big in Pennsylvania, Florida, the two most important states for Republicans, and we're seeing incredible internal data that is very positive for them there. Next slide. And this is the most important slide of them all. So it, it's confusing, but net net, it just shows how many. If you see, look at Pennsylvania and Florida. The net additional new registered voters, Florida Republic, Republicans have picked up 112,000. That now no, that number is now up to like 150. In Pennsylvania, this number is now up to 100,000. So, so they've picked up new in terms of the Democrats that register to vote, new new voters, and Republicans that register to vote. And what we're doing is the net delta between the two, and you, you're seeing 100. Sorry, that's 2016 outcome. Um, you're seeing that 116,000 in Florida and 200,000 in Pennsylvania. 200,000 more Republicans are, have, have registered to vote than Democrats in Pennsylvania. That's, and we could send these slides to you. But it's, just, it's just kind of surprising because you would think that with, with, a, with, a, with a president that's not very well liked uh, from a lot of people, you would think that there'd be a big voter registration drive, right? In these, if you're a Democrat, you would think that, that there would have been a big voter registration drive in these key, key swing states. And so it's a sign that somehow, somehow, some way, um, maybe it's fracking. You know, the Democrats made some big promises during the primaries to wipe out fracking and Pennsylvania is a huge fracking state. So maybe they motivated an extra 200,000 people to uh, become Republicans, but it, it's a very surprising. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I'm sorry about this one. I guess the questions. I, I, yeah, maybe the format change. I don't know if you, you have access to that slide. If you if let you... me check really quick. Well, in the meantime, I'm going to stop the share here and I'm going to look at the questions that were. Um, we had a question from Rogelio Rosemena that said, Does it really matter who wins the US 2020 election, crazy Trump or disoriented Joe? <laughs> <laughs> um, it matters for certain trades like cannabis, cannabis equities, uh, they, they're going to double under um, under Joe Biden. Um, energy stocks will double under under Trump and probably they'll do OK under under Biden because if it's a 50 50 Senate. But if Biden wins, um, so it depends on the sector. Um, it depends on 
you know, what you care about. If, if it's, if you're thinking about infrastructure, I think both, it doesn't, I think both candidates are going to spend money on infrastructure. Both candidates are going to weaken the dollar. So it really doesn't matter there. Trump's, Trump's essentially a Democrat. I mean, he, he has moved the entire Republican party to the, to the, to the center, more left center. And um, the, the, the typical rhino Bush Republican fiscal conservative is almost extinct in America. So uh, yeah, they're, they're, in some ways, there isn't a lot of difference between, between them. But um, yeah, I think that's a fair question. Absolutely. I don't know if you guys can see the, the slides I'm projecting, but whenever you're yeah. ready, there it is. Yeah, this is, um, so here's, here's an important thing. Over the last couple of weeks, um, the, if you, the betting odds, like, so when we look at, we want to look at the polling data, which is one thing that's like, um, that's your polling services and your real clear politics. That's one thing. But if, if you look at the betting sites um, in, in the last week or so, it, Trump has actually narrowed the gap. Uh, what, this, what this chart shows, it, this is like a week or week, this is like, this chart is about 10 days old. But since then, uh, Trump has come up dramatically um, in the betting sites, like in terms of Florida, Pennsylvania. So in terms of the betting sites, like predicted, Trump has narrowed the gap quite a bit over the last couple of days. This chart's about a week old. But what it shows you here is that it shows you how poorly Trump was doing in 2016 on the betting sites, which is really, so that lower line there, the betting sites, not a lot of people are talking about this, but the betting, that, that's how poor Trump's, after the Billy Bush tapes, um, you know, Trump's odds were almost at 10%. Now Trump's odds are at 30, 35%. And now this week, they're more up to 40. So it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's so as bad as Trump has done, as, as bad as it, you know, people are talking about blue waves, oh, 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 ah, ah, blue waves. But Trump is doing a lot better in the betting sites. That's real money. That's not a poll where someone calls you up. The one thing about polls is there's such a toxic political environment in the United States. I'm telling you, I've talked to many people. We've, 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 we've asked so many people this. But if someone called you on the phone, a stranger, and said, are you a Trump supporter? I mean, would you answer yes? I mean, I, a lot of people would not. And so there's this like... Polling can't be trusted because Trump is so controversial. Uh, he's such a jerk in so many ways. Uh, if you if you say you're a Trump supporter, you, your your house could get, get vandalized. No, but uh, there's there's just this this silent vote that is showing up in the betting sites because the betting sites is not a poll where some stranger calls you on the phone and says, "Are you a Trump supporter?" This is actually pe people putting up cash. And so the cash market is telling you it's a lot closer than, uh, than, than everybody thinks. Uh, next slide. And th yeah, this is, a, this is a really good one. So this, this is a mind blower, right? So if you look at, if you look at, at 2016, Hillary Clinton, um, she was up in Michigan, just that if you can take if you, if you see down the bottom and go to the red, so bottom says Michigan, 60, and then you move over to the middle, says four years ago. Clinton was up by 11% in Michigan, and she lost by about 1%. Same thing in Pennsylvania. She was up by 6% in the polls, and she won, lost, she, and she lost by one. So these, poll, these polls, these polls are off by like, you know, you're talking about 10, anywhere between 10 to 5% across the gamut, across the, uh, across the, uh, uh, the, the, the what, what are called the swing battleground states. I guess my point is, if you see Trump in a tied poll, he's probably up by five. I mean, that's what, that's what, the, and this, and by the way, this isn't just in America. Our data, we looked at Bolsonaro, same thing. You look at the, the polls in that first round with Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro has a lot of Trump qualities and not well liked. And, you know, they're not nice guys in some ways. Um, this and, and, and Salvini in Italy, these 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 uh, these these candidates, these anti these uh, anti establishment candidates. There's something going on in the polls where the polls are off by in all those races. Boris Johnson, 
They were the, the media in, in England was telling us that the polls were tightening. He won by the biggest landslide since Margaret Thatcher. So we've had six different examples of polls in the last four years around the planet Earth, consistently off by five to ten percent. So when you see someone tied, when you see an, a populist or an anti-establishment candidate tied, he's probably up, you know, three, four, five. So you want to see if you're a Biden fan and you want to really want Biden, Biden's got to be up by, I think, 20 in the polls, 15, 20 to be really safe. Uh, next one. And this just gets into 30-year um, treasury. As you can see, the pricing in uh, Democrats and re re Republicans spending more money. We're going to have much higher bond yields uh, on, the, on the left hand side there. So you're talking about the 30 years about to bust out of that. We're going to see how much higher bond yields next year. So U.S. Treasury yields going much higher. Inflation expectations surging as uh, as the threat of a blue wave comes in, threat of Trump infrastructure spending, another another two trillion dollar plan here on, on the on everybody's talking about in Washington now after after we've already spent a couple trillion. So a massive deficit expen expense, uh, expect to massive deficit spending is increasing inflation expectations on the right hand side. And, um, and that's very important for Panama. And dollar index, um, as you can see uh, on the far right hand side, it's kind of cut off if, if you have on my screen because of the, because of the uh, images, don't worry about it. But it's it, the dollar is, is at multi uh, multi year lows now, uh, lowest level since oh, about 2018. It's heading back toward the 2018 lows, and as we say here, we got 200 billion, 200 billion of Treasury bond sales greater than the Fed uh, QE asset purchase. That's the next six months. So that's that's a big big number. And um, and that that's pretty much wraps it up. But uh, but I think we covered you know kind of perfectly uh, the the dollar rates, treasuries, and uh, political and credit risk. Thank you so much, Julio, for having our back there and, and being able to project those slides. Fantastic job, Julio. Thanks. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you, guys. We all say to each other when we're organizing events. We have each other's backs. You know, isn't that <laughs> awesome? Um, so we also have a question from Abraham Espino, and he asked, and Abraham, you can, you can, you know, you can ask it out loud too if you prefer. <laughs> I can read it, and you can chip in if you want. Um, can you comment on the dichotomy between Wall Street indexes higher than at 2019 year end, in spite of COVID and the high unemployment rate and decrease in the U.S. GNP? Okay, so we're we talking about the Dow. What, what, I'm sorry, what index? He's going to unmute. But I saw him nodding. Hi. The, yeah, yeah, he's... The Dow index, yes. Oh, the Dow. Yeah. And see, so why it's a yeah, Well, number one, the Dow is filled with industrials that are very globally exposed. So with a weaker dollar, um, that's really helping the Dow big time. Because the, the the last couple of years, especially like 2016, 17, the Dow is underperforming a lot because of the strong dollar, and then it's just the QE. I mean, these they're, they're doing, you know, there's a theory, there's all these different theories in the United States around quantitative easing and and the the the, the earnings yield of a, of a corporation it becomes so much more important in a QE environment. So the theory is is that with like the traditional value investor like a Buffett. And I, uh, I met with Charlie Munger in um, Omaha in 2016, well, about just before that, 2014, I met with Charlie and he, and he talked about, you know, there, he said, Larry, the hardest thing to do each day is stare at a screen and do nothing. And Buffett's now sitting on 140 billion of cash because they have nothing to buy and um, there's, they have nothing to buy because they, they want to buy value and everything's getting bid up. So because the Fed is doing 120 billion of asset purchase a month, people are revaluing. People say well, the, the traditional PE, price to earnings ratio doesn't mean anything because it's about the earnings yield relative to the 10 year treasury yield. So if the 10 year treasury yield 
is 70 basis points and the company has an earnings yield of 2%, uh, you want to own, like they'll pay up for uh, a company, a much higher valuation than they ever would have. So that's, those two things are driving the Dow up. Even though we're in the middle of, you know, we came out, we were just close to depression in March. Now the Dow is nearly all time high. The transports, by the way, hit an all time high this week. So once again, that's exposed to a weaker dollar. All right. Um, we have another question over here, moving on to China um, with Ana Yanareas. And you can, of course, you know, you can wave over here, Ana, if you're available, you can ask yourself or I can read it out loud for you. She says, what kind of policies do you expect Joe Biden to adopt with regards to China? Okay, so China, if Trump wins, Chinese equities will like China A shares or the FXI ETF or the A shares, they'll do, if, if Trump wins, I think China stocks will, will get hurt because tr Trump will really attack China more aggressively knowing that he does not, he's not worried about re-election. And he'll really follow through on his protectionism uh, or at least you know, trade more um, in some ways. Um, whereas if Biden wins, it's going to go back to a much more, you know, uh, I guess 1990s or even 2000s China relationship, where I mean, think about the, the, the China. A lot of a lot of wealthy Chinese were donating money to the Clinton Foundation. They were very close with the Obama administration, and that's what has riled up a lot of like middle class Americans because. Both Democrats and Republicans have very cozy relationships uh, with Chinese companies, and um, so yeah, China China equities are going to do really well in a in a Biden administration. Now Biden will try to he's, he's trying to because Trump has stolen so much of this middle class vote in 2016 uh, from. I mean, what's amazing is Trump had. 2 million more votes than Mitt Romney did um, in 2012 in versus 16. So, and a lot of those were independents and Democrats. So, so Trump's been able to steal those middle class people. And uh, so Biden will, will, will talk a tough game, but he's, it's really going to be a very favorable relationship with China. So, Chinese equities probably do very well in a, a Biden administration. And that'll be interested in Panama. We've been, you know, seeing a lot of activity here as well. And um, Alexander asks, do you believe that USA will do a soft default on its treasuries, meaning that they will repay the bonds with much depreciated dollars? That's coming down the road for sure. The only way to get out of this kind of debt is um, 27 trillion now of debt. The Obama years, I think they put on uh, five or six trillion of debt, and now Trump's put on six or seven. So the last two presidents have put on another an extra, an extra, like it's an extra, you know, twelve trillion. So it's the only way out of that is to, and it's too much. You can't grow out of it because it's just too much debt to grow now. So the only way out is to depreciate the currency. And that's why um, Bitcoin today was. You know, made a big move. Uh, you have you have companies like um, uh, data processing companies, uh, PayPal, uh, cash processors are now accepting Bitcoin. So you, there's all these different you know, people are even talking about you know China China taking over the, the currency reserve currency status. But the U.S. still what's still amazing about it is no matter how how bad the bear case is for the dollar. It's still 60 to 65 percent of all transactions globally are in dollars. So it's it's a long way to go, and uh, there's a long a long way for depreciation. I mean, we're, we haven't even started yet. I see some nodding over there in the audience. Um, if anybody wants to, you know, open up and make this a conversation, you can just unmute, raise your hand, or or put something else on the chat, and we can make it in several different directions. Um, yeah, so yeah, let's do that. I'd, I'd, that'd be fun. So um, let me see. What else do we have here? So Alejandro, I can see that you turned yeah. your camera on and your question was next. So go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to jump in. 
Um, hey, thank you, hey, Sean, Larry, you really hit on the nail with what I've been reading. And, and, and this week I read an article that the IMF is thinking about making a new Bretton Woods and it's, it's, it's all connected, you know, it's all connected with the rise of digital currencies. And we've seen that the stimulus is like maybe a soft landing of universal basic income. That is something that they are thinking of doing. And with the central banks creating these digital currencies, they can bypass the banks. So they can have a more direct relationship with, with the citizens. So I think it's a big shift, you know, coming. And, and I think that it's more in the near term than in the long term. But I just wanted to get your two cents on on on, on that. Yeah, so so what's what's crazy is we're, we're already doing your, your, what's called UBI, universal basic income. It's here, and, and I think it has a lot to do with why the inflation expectations are rising. You think about like in the post, after I wrote my book, um, it, when we did a fiscal plan in the United States 2011, 12, it, it didn't have any direct connectivity with Americans and it created a lot of inequality. So you had a fiscal plan that didn't last very long no UBI, no universal basic income. Unemployment benefits went on, but it, it, they really uh, cut them off and they didn't, they weren't as, as broad as they are now. So now you have this whole millions of people that have uh, been collecting uh, unemployment benefits, which is going to, to your point, it's going to turn into UBI, which is more, much more from the treasury than the, the Fed right now. So the, the treasury department is literally placing hundreds of billions in people's banks account, bank accounts this year for the first time, bypassing Congress, which is, I, I think is fantastic. We bypass Democrats, Republicans. It's, let's just send the money to people and, and get it to the people that need it and then the right hands. Um, in terms of the Fed and the digital currency game, it's talked up now. And the IMF's writing white papers and all that. It's just that... Um, I do a lot of meetings. Well, what we do in New York is we'll take the clients to meetings with Fed governors and we'll do a dinner. And so we've had a lot of dinner, not, not this year, <laughs> but last year. And, but we do, we do calls like this. And the digital currency movement in terms of the central banks, like the Fed, is still pretty slow. Um, so it'll come, but it, it's just not happening as fast as you might think. But whereas... You know, so I think it's coming for like down the road, but I, I don't see it having the immediate impact in the next two years. Okay, you got a thumbs up over there. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for, for jumping in. Um, and Rogelio Rosemena asked, what currencies will get stronger against the dollar? Okay, so most likely Mexican peso. Uh, I, I, love, I love the Mexican peso here, you know, energy producer countries. Um, the Euro to some extent, because you just have the US is, is printing much more and it's the global, what's happening is like CNY, like the Chinese currency is striking so much and it is it's a massive global multiplier. So it, it has a big impact on Europe. Like the Euro, the Euro should be weaker, but the last week it, you just seen this really amazing strength from the euro and mo most importantly the pound the pounds had five years of uncertainty with brexit uh, i talked with this morning with a, a major major uh, brexit leader and you know who, who's really you know brexiteer nigel farage and he's telling me that it's pretty much over and so they're going to do a deal with the europeans and um all this uncertainty of four years of Brexit is gonna be over for the first time. And you're gonna see just an amazing appreciation. The pound's probably gonna be 160 to the dollar in like two years. And uh, more, more people are gonna come back um, to the UK and the, you know, some of these companies have left. And um, once that uncertainty is out of the way. So those are, those are the ones I like. Thank you so much. And, and that addressed also Mary Louise's question down there. And Luis Fernando, thank you for being here and joining us. He says, gotta go, apologies, great talk, thank you. Um, so we have, I, I got another question on the private chat from Habib. Um, I don't know if, if you're available, if you wanna ask it 
ask um, out loud, unmute yourself, I can read it. He says, interesting fact regarding the tide poles. However, most of the examples used on anti-establishment candidates are with first time candidates, Brazil, UK. Would this still apply on a re-election candidate like President Trump? That's fantastic. I love it. In our Bloomberg chat today with the institutions, uh, a billionaire CIO from a hedge fund asked the same question. And it's so important because you're right. We're all, you know, a lot of people are assuming that that, that anti-establishment wave um, is sustainable and it may not be. And um, there's some evidence that you know, the likability of Trump in terms of you know, from 2016 and now hasn't really changed, whereas Hillary had very poor likable scores. Uh, Biden has much better scores than Hillary. So net net there's a loss there for Trump. And that's the biggest risk for the Trump campaign. But yeah, that's, that's a great point because nobody has uh, been able to, uh, we've never seen an anti-establishment candidate be reelected, <laughs> right? As it happened. So, but I would say that the, 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 here's the basic stat. If you take one thing or one stat away from this conversation, the crazy thing about the electoral college is that 18 counties will determine the U S election. So think about this, think about this 18 counties. So in 2016, Trump won 2,330 counties. So think about that number, 2,330 counties, Trump won. Hillary won 289 counties. So 2,330 to 289. So obviously Hillary won the populated counties and Trump won the land masses. But what's crazy about all those counties is that only 18 will determine it because so you've got two counties in Florida, two counties in Pennsylvania, maybe one or two in, in, in Ohio. So all those 18 counties are in the uh, are in the battleground states. And Trump is taking Air Force One into the, he's literally been in Pennsylvania twice, Michigan. He's in all these states um, with thousands. I mean, just crowds look, looks like a you know, soccer stadium filled with people. Uh, whereas Biden is just rolling the dice and staying at home and uh, all week. And so it's a, it's a real big, uh, gamble for both both parties, right? Because Trump's gambling in the sense of like, okay, it's a COVID world and uh, Biden's uh, staying home. So we'll see. Thank you so much. Great question. So we're going to land this plane. We're going to bring it down. Um, Shlomo, you're still going to get a chance to ask your question. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yes. Larry, are, up you, are you up for happy hour? <laughs> <laughs> because this is what I propose. We're going to um, put in a survey on the chat, a link. And I want to ask you all to go into a survey. It'll take you three minutes to fill it out and give us some feedback. You guys all know that we can improve what we measure. And for us, it's really important to get your feedback on this event so that we can plan future events for you guys. So Juan Carlos is gonna do me the favor, hopefully to um, put the link there. So it's there. So while you guys go and fill out that link, you can still listen. And we're gonna do a little happy hour time so that Shlomo can ask a question and maybe somebody else wants to stay around for happy hour. In the meantime, whoever needs to go, it's 7.30. So before you go fill out the survey and all that, let's just give a thank you um, to Larry, for, to Maury for bringing Larry on board. This has been amazing. And for everybody, Eli Fashka for helping bring us together in the Zoom room. And Eli, you are awesome. Thank you so much. So you can use your reaction button over there and give us a huge clap or, you know, or any little emoji you like. Oh, not that one, not the surprise and, one. And thank you, Julio. Thank you. And Julio as well. So if you got to go, you got to go. Um, please do fill out the survey. That will be greatly appreciated. And um, Shlomo, all yours. And we'll do five, five, more, five minutes happy hour. Is that OK, Larry? Sure. OK, good. <laughs> OK, so my, my comment is very simple. And it goes with what you were saying. I think it's important to know uh, in the case of the 2020 election versus the 2016 election, 
is who's running against Trump in this case. And I think the Democrat Party tried to focus, tried to put all their focus together on a centrist or what looks like a centrist candidate. Yeah. And the only way, the, the way I see the, the Republicans running against him is saying he's controlled by the far left. He's the puppet of the far left. He's going to do the bidding of China. He's going to do, and that, that's the way they're pushing it. Yeah. Because, because this, is, this is a guy that's more centrist. And it's no coincidence that once he established that he was uh, electable, all the other candidates dropped out. I mean, it was like in one fell swoop, Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren, all these, all these other candidates, with the exception of Sanders, they dropped out immediately because they said, okay, let's focus on this. Let's focus yeah. on this guy. Let's put our strength behind this guy. So I think, I think it, it's, it's, it's a different effect, so to speak, because A, he's not taking things for granted, even though he, he's not campaigning as aggressively, maybe because of COVID, maybe because of health, we don't know, but he's not um, campaigning as aggressively as Trump is. But the way I see it, he's a different kind of candidate. I mean, he responds differently, he acts differently, and I think that will have an effect He's, he's much people. more he's much more likable than Hillary Clinton. There's no absolutely, question. absolutely, and, and I think that that that's an important point. I mean, uh, I I can take off my mask here and say that I don't like Trump. And four years ago, when somebody told me, "Wait, you don't like Trump? Would you vote for Hillary?" I said, "Well, if I was an American, I'd have a hard time making a choice." I mean, <laughs> I, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm an honest. You're person. not alone. You're not alone. Yeah, exactly. I'm an honest person. I would have a hard time making a choice. If, if, I'm an, if I'm an American today, if somebody tells me, uh, if you were an American and you were eligible to vote, who would you vote? Would you vote for Biden? I would say without question, I would vote for Biden. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things. And the last thing I wanted to say is there's a big Republican base in the, in the, in, in the Lincoln Project and, 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 and others of that kind that are also campaigning against Trump. And I think that also helps. The fact that people are using that people that were op were all operatives for the Republican Party are now they're doing it independently. They're not they're not uh, on their on their Biden's employ, so to speak, but they're doing it anyway. So I think those things are hidden factors into uh, what may show up, who may show up to vote, and all of that. Yeah, the the, uh, the rhinos hate Trump. The Bushes, the McCain family, all the traditional Republicans just hate him so he and it's amazing like what, what blows me away is that you had my my father for example um didn't vote into the he was a protest didn't want to vote for trump because he's a bit lifelong republican and so there's a lot of republicans in 2016 that didn't vote for trump like just like you said millions of of, of bush republicans of you know mccain republicans the traditional republicans um I'd say I'd say at least two or three million show, didn't show up, and then the mind blower is that Trump still had two million more votes than Romney. So it shows you how the connectivity with the with the blue collar, blue collar people, uh, you know, the bikers, you know, the bikers like them, you know, the truck drivers. But you, you're right, and then on that uh, in the educated class around the cities, he, I think Trump's down by like thirty points, like in terms of like. You know, just a suburban voter, mm -hmm. he's getting destroyed because he, like to your point, he's getting, uh, he's losing those, um, those people that would, he's he's losing the people that that didn't like Hillary that will, will vote for 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 Biden. Trump's losing those people. Before we end happy hour, Alexander also asked about the direction of gold prices. Gold, I, I love gold. Uh, I love gold and silver. I just think gold. I think you want to own a basket of the much oil, oil, oil stocks are much cheaper than gold. What happens is with these things, when you go into a, a dynamic around um, currency potential crisis or what we call negative real yields in bonds, or right now we have a negative real yield of about 1% on the 10 year. Um, what happens is the, the original audience, the, the original, think of it like a football stadium, most people in the football stadium are are there for the gold and that's the easiest most liquid thing that it's gold's probably 30 times more liquid than silver but what happens is when the crisis becomes more mature uh 
it broadens out to all the other commodities, especially silver and copper and oil. And so right now, a lot of the other commodities are much cheaper than gold. But I, I love I love gold. They're, they're all I think they all go up over the next five years. Uh, gold commodities could be the next tech stocks, but the uh, there's some commodities that are a lot cheaper than others. And like the, like you just look at the oil to gold ratio. Um, the oil to gold ratio is incredible. And another thing about the oil market is we've taken about two and a half trillion dollars of capex out of oil the last three four years since 2014. And this year, uh, CapEx has been destroyed, which is capital expenditures, so that's exploration. That's, you're just talking about 86% of the CapEx budget over the last five years has, has been just gone. And so that means they're not exploring. And that means if you get a snapback in demand because of a reopening next year, uh, oil and oil stocks could do quite a bit better than gold. They, the gold would do well, but because of the amount of just the decimation of the oil uh, exploration and the fact that if you get a snapback in demand, then there's no way the oil industry can, 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 can go find enough oil that quickly. So there'll be like this period where the oil price, I think we get, I think oil could be 180, $80 a year from now, which is a double. Whereas you know, gold uh, is going to, I think, do well, but uh, I think you want to be in a basket of other commodities. All right, everybody. So happy hour. I think we're we're all good to go now. <laughs> let Larry go and enjoy the rest of this evening. And there's a lot of valuable learnings today, Larry. To me um, personally, I see people nodding over there. If you guys want to just you know put it on the chat, maybe one or two things that are like aha moments for you, or things that were really insightful, and just you know send some love over to Larry and and. Um, anything that was like particularly interesting. Um, I think, Larry, that I would say that this has been a very optimistic talk, even though there are some areas um, where we know that, that you know, um, there's been some trouble. Um, ultimately, I feel that this moment has been very upbeat and inspiring and optimistic. Um, so it just feels wonderful. And I'm going to read to you some of the things that are on the chat. Lots of thank yous. Lots of thank yous to the panel, um, to you. Um, very informative and refreshing. Looking forward to more events, wonderful event. Thank you for your insight and candor, Larry, and enjoy Rio Mar. Um, very valuable information, great charts. Thanks, very informative, great insights. I hope to hear more from you. So I do hope we can send the contact information on via email as well. Um, for Larry's um, website and the rest, and and you know of course read his book and all the rest. So and uh, so can I just say one thing? How about a big hand for Anna Karina? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for everything. You're so professional. I love that you, you your management style. You think of all the details. You know you didn't you didn't no stone was unturned in this project. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, Larry. Means means the world to me. Thank you all. Okay, well, big hug. I love you all. Can't wait to see you again. Okay. Bye, Anna. Say, Larry, you are an official member of our club, okay? Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.